Hey there, sports and society people. Welcome to my humble home here in Durham, North Carolina. Now, this is the last lecture in our week on the business of sports. And today we're gonna to look at a new aspect of the business of sports, namely the explosive growth of sports video games. Now, there's only one problem here. I don't really know anything about sports video games myself. I grew up in the age of pinball wizard and the arcades and pinball machines. He's a pinball wizard, there has to be a twist. A pinball wizard got such a I am happy to say that there is an expert in the sociology of sports video games in this very household, and that's why we're here. And that's my oldest son, Ray. So let's go upstairs and see what insight Ray can offer us into the world of sports video games. Come on. Okay, sports and society people. This is my older son, Ray. He's Lucian's older brother, and he's a fan of sports video games. He spends a lot of time playing them. What are you playing right now, Ray? Um, NBA 2K13. And do you have specific teams that are playing each other right now? Yeah, it is the Chicago Bulls and the Miami Heat. So I think a lot of older people, like people like me in their 50s, want to know why are sports video games so fun to play? Um, just because you can't really, normal people can't really get the experience of being in the NBA and, and our, our other major sports, so video games kind of help. So you play NBA games. What other games do you play? Uh, NFL football and soccer, FIFA soccer. Cool. Great. Okay. Thanks, Ray. So here we are back downstairs in my house again, and I'd like to talk a bit about sports video games right now. And our key words for today are Jean Baudrillard, hyper-reality, video game hate versus video game love, Henry Jenkins, The Lively Arts, Sports Video Games, Pong, Wii, Sound Engineering, Multiplier Effect. So one way to start beginning thinking about sports video games is to think about a French theorist named Jean Baudrillard who died a few years ago and was a, a quite influential thinker. And Baudrillard introduced the idea of hyper-reality. And what he claimed was that in our increasingly technological world, the borderline between what's real and what's fake, what's real and what's a sham copy, has become increasingly blurred and it can be increasingly difficult to distinguish the fake from the copy, the real from the authentic. And an example of this, a classic example, would be the Venetian Casino in Las Vegas. It's a copy, if you've been there, of the real Venice in Italy, in northern Italy. And in Las Vegas, in the Venetian, you have canals, you have gondoliers singing cheesy songs, you have replicas of St. Mark's Cathedral and Piazza San Marco, a replica of the Doge's Palace. And if you close your eyes and listen to the gondoliers singing, or maybe just open them and look at the replica of the famous Venetian Campanile, you could almost imagine that you are in Venice. So here in this hyper-reality, in this hyper-real state, as predicted by Baudrillard and imagined by Baudrillard, you have a confusion of the boundary between the real Venice and the fake Venice. I think most of us still know that the fake Venice is the one in Las Vegas, but the borderline between the real and the fake has become more blurred. Now, this is what's been happening with video games, because as video game technology has increased, the replica, the fidelity of the video games has become increasingly uh, sophisticated, increasingly to mimic the real. So for example, if you're playing Call of Duty, the graphics look almost like real life reporting or a film, a documentary film about the war in Iraq or Afghanistan. Again, I think one can still tell where uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are and what experience is like there as something different from playing the video game. But the video games have become a form of hyper-reality in the sense that they've become harder to distinguish from the real thing. 
Now this is happening in sports video games as well. Take a look now at a little bit of NBA 2K, uh, the 2014 edition, and this bit that includes LeBron James and other players. Labels out here, now they can't tell me nothing. We give that to the people, spread it across the country. Labels out here, now they can't tell me nothing. We give it to the people, spread it across the country. Can we go back? This is the moment. Tonight is the night. We'll fight till it's over. So we put our hands up like the ceiling can hold us. So what you can see here is that it's not all that easy to distinguish this from a t this fake video game from a real televised game and the quality of the graphics. So with sports video games and video games in general are an example of Baudrillard's concept of, of the hyper real. And when we go back a little bit and start to think about what we should make of video games and sports video games in terms of whether they are good or bad or a problem or not, we tend to have two very polarized positions the idea of video game love and what I'm calling the idea of video game hate. Now, video game hate is what's typical, especially of parents like me, who are not crazy about video games and sports video games. Ray probably plays a couple of hours of sports video games a week, maybe not quite that much, excuse me, a day. And that seems to me, as video games seem to a lot of parents, like an awful lot of time to be sitting in your room playing these games with your little finger thing. And so you have video game haters who will say video games isolate people from other people. Video games promote obesity because people are sitting on their butt playing these games. Uh, the video games also can promote violence because so many of the games are very violent and involve destroying other people, shooting guns, doing awful karate chops and mixed martial arts and so forth. So video game hate sees video games as a new social scourge in society. But we also have the opposite phenomenon of video game love. And these are people, sometimes people who play the games, like Ray, who thinks the games are great and you know all power to him, but also scholars and uh, game studies critics who say video games are actually a really good thing. And one of the most prominent figures here is a man named Henry Jenkins. Um, Henry Jenkins is a leading figure in uh, critical game studies. And he argues that video games are an example of what he calls the lively arts. He argues that American culture in particular over the last 150 years has produced these new unconventional popular art forms, uh, jazz, comic books. And he argues that video games are a part of this tradition of creation, of creativity. And in fact, when you look at video games, the graphics, the storylines, the platforms are often, not always, but often incredibly beautiful and complex and aesthetically interesting. So it's possible to, to agree in part with Jenkins that video games, including sports video games, are a form of artistic creation. Jenkins and others would also emphasize that games often involve social networking. They're not simply about isolated teenagers sitting at home uh, in, their, in their cut off from their friends playing these games, but that many games involve multiplayer uh, forms of participation that, that link people up to another. Uh, game scholars will also say that well, kids will play violent video games, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily uh, going to go out and shoot a bunch of people or that they're somehow neatly internalizing the, the kinds of things that they see on the video game screen. So this is a bit of background about video games uh, and uh, how we ought to think about them. My own feeling as an anthropologist is it's not really very useful to either say, ah, video games are a stupid, dumb thing, or to say, oh, video games are so wonderful, I'm gonna let my kid play 12 hours a day. Now, our task as critical thinkers about uh, sports, and in this case, sports video games, is to try to not make these sweeping judgments and instead try to understand sports video games as this cultural, social, political, economic phenomenon that we need to try to understand. And in fact, I should say as a parenthesis that there's really very little good research as yet by anthropologists or anybody else about sports video games. And if any of you out there is thinking about going to graduate school and maybe writing a dissertation in cultural studies or anthropology or sociology, I think the examination of sports video games would be a great topic for you. So what about sports video games in particular. What we see is an arc of tremendous growth as we've seen in video games uh, in general. 
Uh, the first sports video game, and I'm old enough to remember this, I'm sorry to say, was Pong. Pong, invented by Atari back in 1972. And Pong was a game that you could only play in a video game arcade. You couldn't bring it home, at least at first. There weren't any special consoles. And it was very crude and primitive. But back in 1972, it looked really space age and high tech. And we, 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 we really enjoyed playing it. So from 1972, you go up to the present where sports video games have become a giant multi-billion dollar industry. We've talked about the mega business of sports uh, this week and the growth of sports video games is a very important part of that. Just think of all the money and labor and, the, and commercialization that goes into sports video games now. It costs about $500 to buy a new PlayStation or a new Xbox. The games are $50 each. You have these gigantic companies like Sony that are making all of this money selling consoles, gigantic programming companies that are selling the software like EA Sports and 2K. So sports video games have become a gigantic business and industry. And this is all, you have to remember, an industry that didn't exist at all in relationship to sports 40 years ago. Uh, just going back down memory lane a little bit, when I was a 13 year old in Italy, they didn't have any sports video games. And if you wanted to do something besides watch a game or play the game, one of the only options was to buy soccer cards. In Italy, you would buy these little soccer cards and then they were adhesive and you'd put them into the team. I did pretty well. I finished up a lot of the teams. Well, here I'm missing some cards. But this was it if you wanted to think about sports beyond going to the stadium or playing. Uh, cards. Uh, maybe you could buy a jersey, but that was hard to do. And it was the same for American sports like baseball. If you were interested in baseball, you could buy baseball cards. Baseball video games? Forget it. Now we're in the new age, the dictatorship of the console. We moved into this age where sports video games are a really important part of the sports landscape in the 21st century. Now there are three specific points that I'd like to raise and talk a little bit about in relationship to sports video games. One is the role of sound engineering and sonics in sports video games. When we think about video games in general, we tend to think about their visual qualities, about their graphics as key to whether they're successful or look realistic or not. But the sound engineering, the sonic effects are just as important and are crucial to creating the reality effect that's part of the intoxication of sports video games. So for the latest version of NBA 2K, 250,000 different sounds were recorded to try to make the basketball game sound as realistic as possible. And one of the things that's been done now uh, is to get announcers who announce regular uh, soccer, football, basketball games also to do the sounds for the sports video game soundtracks. So for example, in NBA 2K, you have Clark Kellogg, Steve Kerr, Marv Albert, who are lead announcers for regular NBA games, also doing the announcing and the sounds on sports video games. Consider and, and listen to, as well as watch, this little bit of a clip from FIFA 2013. And what you'll hear here is the announcers, Martin Tyler and Alan Smith, who are very well-known announcers of real soccer games. Time for the match. Martin Tyler here to describe it for you with my good friend Alan Smith. Yeah, hi there, Martin. Walking into the ground today, I've just got that feeling. Feeling it's going to be a really good afternoon. And this match features Hamburg, and they're against Eintracht Frankfurt. Well, it's wonderful to see the champions in such good spirits now. All well, that tension's gone, they've clinched it, and still two games to play, but they've done so well. So here, the graphics in FIFA 2013 are not perfect in their replication of a soccer game. They still look a little bit robotic, computery, although they're very sophisticated. FIFA 2014 is more realistic, and probably by FIFA 2018, it will be impossible to tell the video game from a, a real game on, on television. Uh, but the, the, the sonic part of it, the sound part of it, the crowd noises, the announcing by Alan Smith and Martin Tyler are already indistinguishable for, from the real thing. So my point is that sound, something that we don't always think of as crucial in manufacturing uh, a sports video game, is crucial to the creation of a reality effect, a reality experience in these games. 
Now, a second point that I wanna make is the way that sports video games now involve what could be called a multiple entry experience. Back in the day when you were playing Pong, all you could do was control your little paddle and where the ball would bounce. That was, that was the way that you played Pong. And until as recently as five or 10 years ago in sports video games, really you only had the option, say if you were playing a, a soccer game, to kick the ball and to make your players move. Well, that has completely changed with technological advancements with the digital revolution. And now if you're playing a game like FIFA 2014, as many of you probably know better than I since you play these games a lot, you can be the player, but you can also be the manager as in the video game sports manager, but also in FIFA 2013, you can be the manager, you can decide what players are going to play when, you can enter in as the team owner and make contracts and make trades and make deals with other owners, arrange to build stadiums. So now uh, the experience of playing video games involve these different multiple ways that you can engage. You can choose to play, to be a player, you can be the owner, you can be the coach or manager, you can be all of those things or some of those things. And the borderland has also, the border has blurred between fantasy leagues, fantasy football, fantasy baseball, which are a huge new aspect of sports that also deserve a lot of study, and sports video games. Because now when you're playing a sports video game, you're playing it and you're controlling the shot or the kick, but you're also playing this role of manager, of coach, and of picking your players. So you can now pick what players are gonna play for what team in a way that was not possible five or 10 years ago. Again, we still have this dimension of controlling the actions, as in, you know, we is the, is the biggest example. You actually replicate the experience of, of hitting a golf shot or doing tennis. But now you have this much more complicated experience where you can come into, you can interface with the game in these multiple different form, forms. Third, a, a final point that I wanna make about sports video games is what can be called their multiplier effect. A phenomenon that I've seen here at Duke University on campus and that I've talked about with some students is students, you know, people who are 18, 19, 20 university students who have gotten interested in soccer or football, if you prefer to call it, I think if that's actually the more proper word for the, for the game, uh, the word used by most of the world. But soccer in the United States, as, as most of you know, is traditionally not a very popular sport. A lot of kids in a newer generation, like Duke students, have become familiar with and interested in soccer through sports video games, through the FIFA EA Sports games in particular. Now, when you walk around the Duke campus, you'll see students wearing Barcelona jerseys or Italia jerseys or Balotelli jerseys. And a number of them will say, well, you know, I didn't grow up watching soccer on TV because it wasn't on TV very often in the United States. I did it through the video games. And through the video games, I've now become interested in the real thing. I'm going to watch the World Cup, and I sometimes watch Premier League games. So what you see here is that sports video games, instead of somehow supplanting the real thing or leading people to play a lot of sports video games instead of going to the stadiums or instead of watching sports on TVs, that sports video games have had this multiplying effect of increasing interest in sports as a whole, increasing the numbers often of people who go to games, of people who are interested in tuning in, of people who are buying jerseys, of people who follow a team. Uh, sports video games have played in, in the vein of this multiplier effect a role in increasing the globalization of sports. So that now if you're a kid in Paraguay who has internet access, you may be a Real Madrid fan, not because you watched Real Madrid games on TV, although maybe you did that as well, but because you were able to play Real Madrid in a FIFA game or one of the other soccer video games. For sports stars, the mega celebrities like the LeBron Jameses and the Cristiano Ronaldos and the Tiger Woods, sports video games have also had a multiplier effect in terms of their marketability and visibility and, um, and the money that they can earn. So LeBron James has his huge contract from the Miami Heat, but he's also getting untold millions for uh, his participation in NBA 2K. So just to sum up, we have here this multiplier effect and the way that sports video games are a new part of the mega business of sports, but actually also increase the other aspects of the sports business, the numbers of people who are interested in the real thing, in the real teams.
So there's a lot more that could be said about sports video games, although as I said, we actually need a lot more uh, on the ground research by scholars trying to figure out you know, what's going on with these games and why do people play them and what are some of the puzzles and cultural and political and historical factors at work. I do think it's clear that sports video games are transforming our culture in some, some interesting ways, large and small. Ray tells me now that at the high school where he goes, when you want to say that something is cool, you'll say, well, that's really 2K after the NBA 2K video game, because that's regarded as, I guess, I don't know, you know, I'm 53, I don't really know about this stuff, but NBA 2K is supposed to be a really great video game. So if you say 2K, that's a really great video game. So here you have an example of sports video games entering into everyday language and, and, and popular culture and being something that uh, kids, especially of a certain generation, are talking about, are spending a lot of time playing, uh, that, have, that have, sports video games have become part of the modern landscape, along with a lot of other weird new things. So this is the last lecture in week six. There will be a Google Hangout with me. Go to the announcements page if you're interested in participating in that. And I'll see you in any event next week for the final week of the course.